All right, so uh, uh, let's see, there were a couple of questions on uh, this, uh, the current assignment on uh, using of usage of 1D Poisson simulations, right? And I noticed uh, uh, there's a parabolic grading. I think you asked about that. And uh, um, was anybody able to find parabolic grading capability in the, within the software? Uh, or uh, you were able to, or yeah? I think you can just like put in the equation and it'll do it. It'll do that, right? Yeah. yeah. For doping or for the for composition? composition. It, it wouldn't let me put it in. For real? Maybe I. You can maybe discuss a little bit amongst yourself and try, but uh, I, I do uh, uh, think uh, it has that capability. I didn't get a chance to try it out myself, but yeah, just check it out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I think it has the capability of doing random grading and that sort of thing. But, uh, to check it out. Okay, yeah. uh, any other questions on the assignment? And I'll have a uh, office hour session on Wednesday if you have uh, further questions on, on, on this uh, particular assignment. So. Okay, uh, good. So uh, what we are talking about, uh, uh, or started talking about in the last class and uh, we'll continue to discuss today, uh, uh, are, are uh, aspects of uh, uh, material science from the perspective of, uh, you know, w with compound semiconductors, we have already seen that uh, the true glory of these materials is you can kind of, at ran you know, uh, almost at will control band gaps and heterostructures and things like that. But from a material science perspective, can you actually grow these layers? You know, that's really what we are discussing right now. Uh, and and uh, uh, especially uh, the, ener uh, the energetics of these uh, 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 structures, especially alloys, and uh, whether uh, an alloy can be homogenous, whether it will be sp spontaneously decomposed into its constituents and, and, and things like that, right? And uh, uh, I started discussing about, uh, uh, the, uh, there are two aspects to this uh, problem. Uh, uh, one is uh, the thermodynamics, right, which tells you which energy configuration is the lowest, right? And the second aspect of it is even though uh, there's a thermodynamics, and we saw in the last class already that uh, a very simple alloy, uh, for example, uh, of the kind AX and B1 minus X, right? That's, we, we were discussing this in the last class. And we saw that there are, uh, uh, you know, there's a certain uh, a Gibbs free energy associated with it. Uh, Gibbs free energy is, is a sum of uh, uh, the chemical uh, potentials of uh, uh, each kind of atom uh, that is in the alloy, uh, you know, A or B. So I runs over A's and B's, right? And, uh, uh, and and how many there are. So it's a chemical potential. And uh, uh, in the end, it, it, it ends up being, uh, uh, in general, it will look like uh, you know, a certain energy uh, minus T times uh, the entropy. Right? We, uh, we, we had discussed that in the last class. And then uh, when we actually started uh, plotting these, uh, the energy, uh, if you remember, the way we uh, did the analysis for it was uh, we said that, well, let's say there are uh, uh, if the co alloy composition is X, then uh, you, you can kind of write down that the net change in energy uh, would be uh, if there were A, A bonds uh, plus if there were B, B bonds. Uh, uh, so that would be, uh, let's say, you know, each bond is replaced by, you know, something like that, right? So if there are A, B bonds, that's a change in energy if you had an A, B bond instead of an A, A or a B, B bond, right? So, uh, so that, that term kind of goes here. And the entropy, uh, uh, we, we, we did some analysis using combinatorics and you know, uh, various, various uh, uh, possibilities of uh, lattice sites. Uh, if you had n sites, uh, then how many of them can be A's and how many of them can be B's, right? And from that, we, we found that the, uh, uh, the entropy uh, looked uh, like uh, uh, you know, n times the um, well, uh, yeah, Boltzmann constant. So it basically, entropy is always Boltzmann constant times natural log of all possible configurations, right? That, that's something we uh, had discussed. And then and, and, uh, for this particular problem, a binary alloy of that sort, uh, we derived that uh, uh, the, the, this, this entropy term uh, would be n times kb uh, times, uh, uh, basically what you have is kind of a sum of uh, xj, uh, natural log of xj, where j is the kind of species again, or, you know, or, so, uh, i is the f fraction of species i. Right? That, that, that's really what, uh, 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 what, what it ends up being, right? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, there's a minus sign here. And I think you know that this is going to be positive because natural log of x is a fraction. So it's negative. So it'll, you know, the entropy term is 
where s is positive, right? So, so. Uh, and, and then essentially it's a game now, it's a competition of the two, right, uh, of, of these two. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and basically uh, what we found, uh, this is what we were plotting, and I showed you a little very simple mathematical sort of plot that uh, at uh, relatively low temperatures uh, uh, you, you may have, you know, this essentially uh, when t is equal to zero, for example, zero Kelvin, this term is not there, right? So, so the, uh, uh, as you raise the temperature, it becomes more, more energy states or more... Uh, configurations become accessible for atoms to move around and all that sort of thing. But at zero temperature, this term is not there. And, 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 and this energy first term essentially will have you know, x times something and 1 minus x times that. So it will, it will have a behavior that would look something like that, right? And then what does that mean? This is the total energy of the, or the Gibbs free energy of the system. And system would rather be here or there, but not the alloy. You know? so, so it's a higher energy situation. But as you start increasing the temperature, as you start increasing the temperature, you start increasing the, this term, right? And, and, and gradually what happens is first you develop two minima, right? And, and if you are uh, trying to create this solid solution of A and B atoms uh, at, a, say, 100 degrees C for this particular example, then uh, you know, uh, uh, thermodynamically what it's saying is uh, you will have uh, s some regions of the alloy which would be, say, maybe you know, uh, about 5%. Uh, a and 95% uh, B, and some regions which are 95% B and 5% A. I mean, so, so it will be inhomogeneous. There will be, uh, 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 you know, uh, decomposition of the alloy into into separate uh, regions with with uh, different uh, compositions. And as you start increasing the temperature, you re reach a point where there's only one phase stable now, right? And this uh, uh, this is, uh, for example, for in this picture is 50-50, say, you know, right at the middle. Uh, but then I, I think you can clearly see that if, uh, if your energies uh, of A's and B's are different, meaning this could be here, that could be there, for example, right? And then you can have minima somewhere else and, and things like that. So, so it just starts tilting. And then that's the origin of, of these phase diagrams, right? So essentially if you ask the question that at zero degrees C, in this particular example, uh, what are the phases possible? So you now plot versus temperature and the composition. So at zero degrees C, you either have all A's or all B's. So there are two phases possible, right? So somehow, you, if you create a material that is 50-50, it's not a stable situation. It will end up going this way and this way and end up at the two ends. Right? That's the meaning of uh, that uh, phase separation. Now, whether that will happen or not is something we'll discuss later today. And that's a question of kinetics. You know? So yes, these are the minima. And let's say you have created a situation, you let us create a system at this point in temperature and composition, and you let it go, right? Uh, and let it sit at 100 degrees C. How long will it take for it to kind of decompose is a question of kinetics and diffusion and rates of those things. And that rate could be 100 years, you know. And, and, and that, so the, those would be thermodynamically allowed, but kinetically forbidden. That's what you'd say that. They're, they're not, uh, you know, because the diffusion rates are very slow or something like that. And I'll give you a concrete example today, which is the silicon germanium alloy system, SIGE, which is a, a very important technologically. Uh, uh, it's a great example of this particular problem, right? Uh, and and uh, we'll see that uh, uh, there, uh, uh, silicon germanium at low temperatures is predicted to have this sort of a decomposition, but it never occurs because since these laws were discovered, the time is not long enough, you know, so it has, it's kinetically forbidden, you know, so, so that's, that's the point here. So, uh, but then some are, uh, so you can take uh, the material and you can maybe heat it up or do something like that and then hasten, or it kind of hasten this, this sort of decomposition as well. Okay, so, uh, okay and this is a very famous, uh, uh, it's called the spinodal decomposition. Uh, I think it's a very generic, very generic uh, sort of a, uh, Composition function, you may have seen it, I think, in, in, in various courses. Uh, and what we'll uh, talk initially today is, is uh, uh, this, this can go into, you can apply the same rules, not just to a binary alloy like this, AX, B1 minus X, but to ternaries, quaternaries, you know, five elements, uh, uh, three, five semiconductors, and all of them. So you can apply them. But you have to make sure, as you can see, there are very few input parameters here. There are the energies involved here, right? And that's pretty much it. This entropy is a very geometric term. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a game in geometry, the entropy term. Okay? Uh, and entropy, you can't play too much with it. It will be fixed pretty much. You know? the, the expression for it would be fixed. 
and uh, here's that. And essentially, uh, the, the, the scale of uh, this problem is clearly determined by a ratio of the energy scale here and Boltzmann constant or you know, the volume or the number of atoms. That, that's completely what determines this, this, this sort of decomposition here. So uh, now, uh, this, this particular decomposition, uh, as you see, uh, the way we have modeled it, uh, what it says is, is uh, you will have uh, let's actually look at the particular case of germanium because uh, th that's, that's obviously of a high interest. So this is a silicon germanium alloy. Uh, and when we say that this is the phase diagram now, let me sketch this. All right, so we are looking at energy. Uh, or rather, let's look at temperature because we, we uh, already uh, uh, have discussed uh, that that, uh, you know, basically, uh, I, 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 is, is it clear how you get this phase diagram from here? So essentially, at any temperature, you look at the minima of energies here and here, and at zero C, you plot that and that. It's, there are points. And then you go to 100 degrees C, you see the minima here and here, so you plot that point here and join all the points. Right? So that's a phase diagram, right? Now, uh, uh, so what it's saying here is, is uh, for example, for silicon and germanium, silicon germanium system, uh, uh, let's pl pl plot it from like zero Kelvin. And uh, for Seagate for system, uh, if you do the calculations of the SART, uh, uh, this is a predicted spin order decomposition of the phase diagram for silicon germanium. So you see the temperature is not Celsius here, it's, this part is Kelvin. 170 Kelvin, so it's obviously negative, very high degree C, and it looks uh, in a very small window of, uh, let's say, 170 K, uh, it, it looks uh, something, you know, it, it, it's a slightly offset, and, and it looks, uh, uh, I think, in, uh, okay, so uh, it, it looks something like this. Okay, so the, the spin uh, the decomposition window, and uh, silicon and germanium uh, at these temperatures are all, both, both are solids, and the alloy is also solid. Okay. So t uh, typically, uh, uh, these are this would be called a solid solution of the two elements. So, so meaning you're mixing two solids, it still remains a solid, but they mix completely. You know, that's that's what the, the physical meaning is, and and and, and so basically uh, there is uh, so the dash. Line, okay, so here uh, th this is where the spinodal decomposition is supposed to occur. Silicon and germanium here, 100 percent germanium on the right and. And then as you start increasing the temperature, uh, you know, at, a, at very high temperatures, I think you, you realize that uh, at a, a silicon has a melting point. So this is solid, but this is a solid solution of A and B, or silicon and germanium uh, solution. So it's basically AX or silicon X, germanium 1 minus X. So, so that's, that's what it, uh, that would look like. And it remains a solid here, right? And you keep increasing the temperature, and then you reach another point in temperature, let's say with silicon, uh, which would be about 1420 or 1410 degrees C now. So uh, you can do, do the conversion. Uh, uh, let's say it's 1400 here. Degree C, not Kelvin. Uh, and, and slightly above that, silicon starts to melt, right? I mean, it's a, it's a solid, starts melting into liquid. Right? So there's another phase transition here. Uh, and and uh, above that, it would become a liquid. Below that, it's a solid. Uh, similarly, germanium starts melting at, at about 950 degrees C or so. So that's 1400 and 950 degrees C, not Kelvin. Okay, so just be clear about that part. Okay. Uh, and, and, and so germanium becomes a liquid and a solid below that. So clearly, there is another phase transition going on there, right? So going from a solid to a liquid. And I think you can see also. That you know the entropy is a driving term here because solid has lot, a liquid has lot more configurations available because its atoms are not in a crystal, it's not ordered, it has lot more randomness or entropy, right? It has lot more, so the temperature is driving it into that as well. You know, so this term is kind of pushing it in the, into that window, and and uh, this is not a line, but essentially uh, it, it has this uh, uh, sort of a curvature here, and uh, uh, so uh, below that. The, the solid, you have a solid solution of Seagay, silicon germanium all throughout. Within this window, we have a mixture of solid and liquid. So, 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 so that's, the, that's thermodynamically uh, uh, allowed, and above that, it's all liquid. So, right. so uh, now, uh, this sort of a uh, decomposition, uh, the, uh, or rather, this sort of a phase diagram, 
um, I, I think you can see that this is all solid phase. It's not, uh, the, uh, uh, but but inside here is is a, a, a uniform. Uh, all right. So I think you understand what's this phase diagram. You know, it's it's basically uh, saying that uh, uh, you uh, the the lines. Or rather, you, you can't really have something here. It would rather go to these other ends here. You know? so, so that's really what it means. Yeah, uh, you, you'd rather be on line. Lines here, and, and then uh, as a result of this, and I will discuss this in a little bit more, uh, uh, basically uh, the phase diagram follows also what's called the Gibbs uh, phase rule uh, with components and phases and things like that. But uh, uh, now, uh, for some. Uh, there are corresponding changes when you add silicon germanium and make these alloys. There are corresponding changes in the band gaps and, and, and transport properties and all kinds of other things. For example, uh, here's, here's the, how the band gap is changing for the CGA alloy. Uh, silicon has 1.1 electron volt uh, and uh, germanium is about uh, 0.7 uh, electron volt or so. Uh, and uh, uh, so as you mix it, the composition changes this way and then you know, it changes uh, according to the delta point in the ba in the band structure, and then the L point takes over, and you kind of it's kind of slightly discontinuous, and you know, also band gap changes like that, and the electron mobility, uh, big, and we'll discuss this in in, in some greater detail later. Uh, the electron mobility is always lower, uh, is lowered because of alloying, and it's because of alloy scattering. There is disorder, and electron waves get scattered because of this disorder and alloy disorder. Uh, uh, but uh, just as a rough numbers, for about 50% CGA, you are looking at close to, uh, um, you know, for, for, for bulk silicon, you'd be looking at maybe about 1,500 mobility centimeters square volts like an electron mobility. Uh, but then by the time you are at 50% silicon germanium, you'd be looking more like, I don't know, 50 or 100. It's 10x 10, 10 hit or mo more than 10x hit. You know, so. uh, and then uh, germanium is even higher mobility, about 2,000, because its effective mass is smaller or even higher than that. Okay. So, uh, so those are some, some consequences of, of what you end up uh, getting here. Now, in terms of the phase diagram, this is one situation. There may be some solids where this, uh, you know, this spinordinal decomposition here may not be at 170 Kelvin. It may be like here. It may intersect with, with, the, with the solid liquid line. It may intersect. And you can have a lot of variety in these. Uh, uh, so, so let me... Uh, for example, uh, uh, yeah, you, you can have them intersect here, right? and then you get this flowery business here. You know, the phase diagram would look like that, and and uh, these would be you know solder, uh, tin, lead uh, sort of mixtures would would would, would behave like that, where uh, you know you, there'll be eutectic points, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So 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 it, it depends on what sort of uh, as you can imagine the energy scales here, uh, and the energy the enthalpies and the heat energies. We're going from solid to liquid will determine these these whether they intersect or they don't intersect and things like that. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> okay, so uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, I, I okay, so you probably have seen this uh, uh, sort of picture uh, that uh, um, there is a g generic rule uh, um, by uh, you know uh, uh, first first introduced by uh, uh, Gibbs himself, uh, Willard Gibbs. Uh, that the uh, number of uh, uh, just as a uh, you know keeping track of of, of the phase diagrams uh, is is uh, the number of uh, degrees of freedom is uh, uh, number of constituents minus number of uh, phases plus two and uh, uh, the two is is because of work and heat uh, you know a couple of energy scales but number of constituents number of phases and and uh, number of degrees of freedom we can kind of look at it. And uh, uh, look at it, look at a particular example and see what it means, and then you can apply it to all three fives and other silicon germanium alloys and so on. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, in uh, if you look at the, so you can have a phase diagram for many things. You can, uh, uh, so if you're looking at alloys, typically we're looking at composition in the x-axis uh, because that's clearly a degree of freedom. You can change uh, what composition you have, but once you fix your composition, you know the other rules uh, get get locked. Uh, here, for example, it's shown versus, as pressure and temperature as two variables. Uh, these are the uh, 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 you know, two degrees of freedom in some sense. Uh, uh, and then uh, water, this is the phase diagram for water, very classic uh, you know, introduction to phase diagrams. And uh, uh, so, so uh, water has only one component. It's all water, right? H2O, right? That's all water. Uh, and uh, so, so C is one for water. That, that's what it means here. Yeah. So, so the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, uh, 
uh, would be, uh, so C is 1, so you get basically 3 minus P, right? So num degrees of freedom is 3 minus the number of phases, right? Now, uh, so now you say, well, uh, what, what are phases? Phases are uh, the, uh, you know, solid phase, liquid is one phase, and gas is another phase. Right? So if you want all of them to coexist, all phases to coexist, so then P would be 3, right? You have three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, right? Then you have no degree of freedom in the pressure and temperature. Degree of freedom becomes 3 minus 3 is 0, right? And that means you have only one point in this plane where all three can coexist, right? Does that make sense? And that's why it's called the triple point. You know, that's one point where all three can coexist, right? And then if you want to have two phases coexist, solid and liquid, let's say, right? Solid and liquid. Then, then obviously you have 3 minus 2, say solid, liquid, or liquid gas, or you know, any, any of those. So that means uh, degree of freedom is 1. And I think you know in a 2D plane, if your degree of freedom is 1, then you have a line. Right? So, so, so you have a point a line and so on, right? So, so that's, that's really the whole game behind this uh, phase uh, rule, Gibbs phase rule. And uh, uh, at this, what, what is this line? Uh, the line is essentially where uh, the chemical potential or the Gibbs uh, free energy uh, of the uh, uh, solid is exactly equal to the chemical potential of the liquid atom, uh, molecules of water. So it costs you no energy if you're sitting on this line uh, for, uh, for molecules to go in, it costs you equal energy, sorry, it costs you exactly equal energy for some atoms, some of the molecules to escape the so, solid ice form or solid form into the liquid as go from liquid into ice. It's exactly the same, right? So, so, so that's the m meaning of this uh, uh, sort of a phase diagram and then similarly for gas. There are obviously a lot of other details uh, and, and uh, in, in, in this picture, uh, but uh, just want, I mean, you can apply this to now uh, gallium arsenide to silicon germanium and and, and so on. Right? So silicon, silicon germanium alloys, the constituents would become two because there's not just water molecules, but there are two kinds of atoms, silicon and germanium now, right? And then from there you can start applying it here and see how it you know falls out. What, what are the how many lines you can have, whether you can have points and things like that. So uh, uh, as an example, if you apply it to lead tin alloys, which is solder, this is again from your rocket. Please read. I'm basically kind of speaking out of the book right now. Uh, uh, so, so uh, if you take uh, 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 lead and tin, uh, now you have two, uh, uh, two, two, two constituents, and you can apply this rule now and then look at phases. Now each one can have a different phase. Lead can be solid, liquid. Uh, tin can be solid, liquid. And you can apply the rule and find out that there must be some points like this, some points like that, and so on. So, so you can get those. Okay. Uh, uh, now, uh, for three fives, uh, you will have uh, a phase diagram of this sort. Okay? Now, three fives are very uh, uh, somewhat different from, uh, you know, say, lead tin and, and, and so on. <clears throat> so, uh, for, uh, for example, let's look at aluminum gallium arsenide uh, for a second. And, and, and for aluminum gallium arsenide, what we're going to do now is uh, ask, uh, what does the uh, phase diagram look like? So, first, we can start with, with, with the composition. Uh, that uh, if you want to create an alloy of aluminum, gallium, and I, I hope you understand this is just a generic term we're choosing. You have all these other three, five combinations, right? So all, all kinds of other combinations. Uh, but uh, you can have a, 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 a picture where you draw, uh, you know, arsenic and aluminum and gallium. So if you had. Uh, uh, if you try to mix them, uh, you know, basically when you're doing for either bulk crystal growth or even in epitaxy, uh, you're starting with arsenic atoms in a crucible, aluminum atoms in another crucible, gallium atoms in another crucible, and you're kind of, you know, uh, putting them together and you're changing the temperatures and, and on a substrate when you're growing this epitaxially, for example. On the other hand, if you are trying to grow uh, this structure uh, in a bulk, then you basically are melting all the stuff and kind of thermodynamically trying to make them crystallize. Right? So, epitaxy is different from thermo uh, from the bulk crystal growth here. But essentially, uh, the the phase diagram, or in some sense, the miscibility of these materials is very very sharp, and it's uh, it ha you have basically just one line here which is stable. Everything else is unstable. Just one line. Yeah. What is that line? It's basically saying you can either have aluminum arsenide, you know, 50 percent aluminum, 50 percent arsenic, right? or you can have gallium arsenide, or you can have any alloy in between them. You cannot have 
you know, something like aluminum arsenic too. That, that, that's not, it's not allowed here. So, so uh, uh, w uh, this is again a thermodynamic result, right? Uh, kinetically, you may be able to set it off here, and it may take you 10 years to reach here into this line, but, you know, uh, uh, but basically what it's saying is if you grow it right, if you grow it right, you should be able to, you know, land here, and then you, uh, uh, it will be very hard for you to get out of this, of, of this line. So you get an alloy which uh, has exactly, uh, uh, you know, uh, some composition of X and uh, this alloy. Uh, that, that, that's basically uh, uh, what is uh, the stable state of this pseudo-binary alloy. Uh, and, and it's continuously stable, uh, meaning it's co you can have any composition and they're all, 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 all stable. Okay. Uh, now, uh, within that line, you can have, again, this uh, liquid, solid liquid sort of curve that, uh, uh, you know, uh, aluminum arsenide uh, will have a certain melting temperature, and, and below that it will be solid, and above that it will become liquid and all that. With, just like silicon germanium, you'll have that as well. But uh, within that window, you can have this sort of situation. I'm just going through a couple of examples, and then we'll look at the corresponding energetics like this for ternary and quaternary alloys. You know. so, so we'll just look at that in a, in a, in a second. Okay. Uh, you can make it a little more uh, complex if you look at, uh, instead of aluminum gallium arsenide, you can look at copper indium selenide, uh, CIS. Uh, uh, and you, if you add gallium to it, you get CIGS, which is SIGS, which is used for solar cells these days, uh, copper indium gallium selenide. Uh, it has a much more complicated phase diagram. So, so it has all these uh, uh, you know, regions which have copper selenide, and you can have regions of beta and gamma phases and all kinds of other things like that. So, so it really depends on the material, uh, but uh, 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 okay, so, so that, that's, that's, uh, that's an example. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, you can have uh, typically situations would be uh, these, the, the solid uh, liquid line uh, could, could, may not intersect with the spin orderly composition line, or it may. It depends on these materials. And uh, for most uh, three fives and most uh, uh, semiconductor silicon germanium sort of atoms, uh, they don't, they do, they do not intersect. They're, the solid liquid line is kind of way above, okay? Uh, but sometimes they can, I mean, so. Uh, okay, so uh, what did I do here? Uh, let me actually go over then, uh, I'll skip a few things here and just go over to uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, specifically for three fives uh, and look at uh, uh, let's say gallium arsenide we already talked about, and then you know gallium nitride, uh, and also two six sort of semi compound semiconductors. And these are the band gap uh, versus lattice constant pictures we have seen it many times before. Uh, so uh, I think you can see that uh, there are not just if you, you can mix gallium arsenide with indium arsenide, you can try to form an alloy of those. Uh, gallium arsenide with gallium phosphide with aluminum arsenide. We have all all kinds of choices. So. Uh, uh, and and uh, what we want to do is set up a generic scheme for calculating, you know, the the ideas of spin order decomposition for all of them. Right? So, okay. uh, so let's start with a very simple model and say that I'll try to create aluminum gallium arsenide, or in general, let's generalize it to A, B, C. You know, atoms are A, <coughs> B, and C, and uh, uh, let's say A is. Uh, I'm going to write it this way because Rocket has chosen to just switch the x and 1 minus x here, so we'll write it this way. Uh, so I want to create uh, this sort of a, a, a this, this composition of the material with, uh, say, uh, B being gallium, A being aluminum, and C being arsenic. So, so that's the, or B uh, being in, indium. So let's look at, in, let's say, indium gallium arsenide. We want to create these alloys. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and these are the band gap versus that is constant. But uh, what we want to now find out is, is uh, what is the, uh, do you see this is not the same as this? This is just two atoms. Right? Now we are talking about three. Right? So it's already different. Right? So it will have, uh, the, this energy will be very similar. The first term would be somewhat similar to this. But this would be quite, quite different. Right? So, but what we'll see is what I wrote here is kind of true. In the end, it will end up being something like this. This is uh, uh, the entropy term. Okay? Uh, and, 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 but, but here you have to look at the microscopic picture a little bit, uh, in a little bit more detail and say that uh, uh, let's look at this sort of uh, crystal and we are saying we are looking at a zinc blend sort of crystal structure and then now you have all sorts of combinations of A, B and C. Uh, sorry, just look at the pictures. Yeah. So this is the C atom, say arsenic sitting here and uh, let's say these open circles are A's, say aluminum. right? 
A, uh, and, and the uh, shaded ones, uh, the, the gray ones, gray circles are Bs. Right? Right? And now you can right away see that uh, if you consider one tetrahedron, just one tetrahedron, you have only five possibilities. Do you see that? I mean, these are the only possibilities. This is uh, no other possibility here. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so let's let's actually uh, formalize that. Uh, so we have <clears throat> all right. So so uh, uh, so that's C. And, uh, uh, and 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 let's look at uh, first. You know, all our A's, right? And what we'll define now are a few parameters that, that will mathematically allow us to get here. Uh, so, so the parameters we're going to now define are, uh, uh, so J will represent which one of these species we're talking about. J is, let's say J is equal to 0 would be this. Uh, J is 1 is that, 2, 3, and 4, something like that. You can have uh, uh, J would be, you can say J is how many of B atoms there are. Okay, so does it make sense? J is like how many B atoms there are, for example. And then corresponding to that, we will actually see there are two more parameters. Uh, one is one would be what you'd call uh, the the, uh, uh, the the multiplicity or how many kinds can you have equivalently looking like that. And then uh, there will be another parameter that will uh, that will basically uh, specify. Uh, the uh, number of combinations you can have them in a crystal. You know, once you now, what, what we are really trying to do is what we did for one point here, right? We said in, in one point I can have you know uh, n factorial by n a factorial and n b factorial sort of thing. But for each point here, we have to do all the possibilities. Does that make sense? For each point, we have to do the math for you know all, all the all the possibilities and then apply it to the whole crystal. That's really what we're trying to do microscopically here. Uh, so J would be, uh, you, you can ask, uh, as J, J can be how many B atoms are there in, in this, in this uh, tetrahedron right? uh, that you consider. So it can be zero B atoms, one B atom, two B atoms, three B atoms, and four B atoms. Right? So that can be four, zero to four, right? That's pretty clear. Uh, now uh, alpha of J now would be, uh, uh, how many of such things can you have, right? I mean, how many of uh, 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 tetrahedra can I have where there are two B atoms? Uh, let's say there are two B atoms. So how many of them can I have? And I think you can right away see that these two can be B atoms, these two, these two, or these two, right? So there are already four of those, for example, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Or any questions here? So let's let's go through this. So alpha. Uh, J, uh, how many uh, uh, of t such tetrahedra can I have where there are zero B atoms, meaning all are A's? It's only one choice. It's only one choice, right? Uh, now, how many can I have where there's one B atom? So let's say this B. That, that's clearly four. If you can go in four places, right? How about two? You'll see it's four, four, and one. So you can check that, right? This is how it's going to look, <clears throat> and uh, as you can know, I mean, this is combinatorics. You'll you'll uh, 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 kind of work this out. Okay, so this is, I'll, I'll give you an assi a problem as well to work this out. Okay? Uh, now, QJ is the multiplicity, or, or rather, uh, 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 when we reach QJ, we are lo looking at how many uh, uh, sites can I have. Uh, QJ is a little more subtle. Uh, QJ is going to say how many sites can I have in this whole lattice now where I can fit exactly, uh, you know, the, say, uh, you know, uh, one, uh, how many can I fit of this sort of tetrahedron, if I'm looking at this, right, uh, of this tetrahedron in the whole crystal and still have the total composition this way, right? Because you can't have all of them go this way because then you'll have exactly one third of A or, or B, right? Does that make sense? So that restri restricts another condition here. And that, uh, result here, uh, what is QJ, you will find here, for example, if you have this, uh, 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 let me just make sure I'm, I'm uh, uh, not, not doing a mistake. But by the way, is this clear or did I do anything wrong here? Is this? Six, Six right? Okay, so I think I was uh, four factorial by one factorial and three factorial, right? 
4 factorial. Oh, yeah, that's right. What did I do? Yeah. You're right. So this should be actually, all right, let's write it this way. This should be 4 factorial over how many atoms you have, j factorial times 4 minus j factorial. Right. That's how it should be. Yeah, I think I, uh, in general, right? So for any j, you should have that uh, because you are choosing this is the formula for that, right? Yeah. And then, so therefore, this would be four. Uh, thanks for pointing out. I, I, I saw you guys were not happy with this, so <laughs> something like that, right? Uh, and uh, and then now QJ would be. Uh, let me just write it down. Uh, uh, so if uh, you force the total alloy of all n sites to have a total composition of a one minus x, b x, then uh, this this term here for for any j would look like x to the power j. 1 minus x uh, uh, to the power 4, if you have 4 here, 4 minus g. And that's how it's going to look. Yeah. And this is something you can work out in general. So if your composition is x, this is what you're going to get. And essentially, uh, one way to also keep check of this, uh, keep a check on this is alpha j qj is going to be equal to 1 in the end. So, so kind of verify that. Because, you know. And uh, uh, you can always go back and apply it to the binary solution, you know, AX, B1 minus X, and it should work out as well. We, this is a more general kind of thing, but I think you can already see it's taking care of all sorts of configurations of combinations of the alloy that can happen. And then uh, uh, based on this, uh, uh, so, so yeah, you can basically work this out. And then uh, uh, based on this, uh, you now have to write down the total uh, uh, energy the total energy, which is this term, is, is going to look, total energy is, is uh, basically the total number of atoms times, uh, so you, okay, we already uh, choose out from the table, alpha j, qj, times. Now each configuration of these atoms you can associate, just like you're associating for each bond, one energy, ea, a, or eb, bb. Uh, here you can associate, for example, this is, uh, you know, say three atoms of A, one atom of B. You can, I mean, I'm just writing it, uh, uh, and, and one C. Uh, you can write it this way. This is one energy of this tetrahedron, for example. And then they will have different energies now. Does that make sense? I mean, they'll have different energies. And therefore, each of them, you have to sum them. That's the total energy of uh, uh, this whole solid, which is an alloy of AX, A1 minus X, B1 minus X, the whole solid now, okay? Big N and atoms. And I think you can see that big N is sitting outside, and this thing, if you forget about the e energies, it sums to one. So, you know, this, this is you know, consistent at least. So it makes some intuitive sense. And the entropy uh, for this uh, configuration uh, is, is, is uh, I think, I'm just going to pick this out from here. Uh, so essentially, what you're getting here is n times kb, just like you had here, n times kb. But now you have, um, there'll be a 3 that will come out because of uh, uh, you know, these powers and all that that you have here. There'll be a 3 that will come out. I'm not working this out because I'm uh, planning to give it again as an assignment problem for you. Uh, plus 1 minus x, ln. 1 minus x. That looks exactly similar to before, but there's a you know, 3 sitting out here because now you're looking at a ternary alloy. 3 elements in it. So. And then minus a sum of these alpha j's and qj's with uh, uh, a natural log of qj. Okay. So th this is how it's going to look. And again, we have used all this Stirling approximation and all that in, 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 in getting here. Okay, so, so that's uh, uh, that's uh, the total entropy, and now you can take this and this, and write your Gibbs, uh, uh, Gibbs energy as E minus TS, and now start minimizing it and try to develop your phase diagram based on this. This is a way to understand phase diagrams for ternaries. Right? right? So you can start start looking at this, and how would you minimize it? Now you see that you have multiple variables. You have, uh, uh, well, you have the composition x uh, uh, that, that shows up, but then there are a, b, and a and b atoms. So uh, typically, uh, well, minimization procedures are, uh, uh, the, the variable that's most convenient to use here is this q. Yeah. 
uh, um, and, 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 and the relation to use here typically is, is, is like that. And read, read through the text where you'll see there will be a couple of relations that you can choose and then based on that you can develop your whole phase diagram. You plot it and see where does this go to minimum and at what compositions of uh, Qs. So, you know, this is your QJ. And, and uh, 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 the J index, I hope it's clear. What is the J index? It's basically, you know, these, these uh, uh, tetrahedra and all that. Okay? And, and there's some more details, like uh, you can choose an order parameter that tells you whether there are regions that are richer in, in, in you know, species A than B. And, you know, even if you have a 50-50 composition everywhere, there may be some regions that are a little richer in a, you know, one species than the other. These are compositional fluctuations in, 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 inside the alloy. And then based on that, you can do the whole calculation. And this is a calculation for indium gallium arsenide, for example. Now, these things are, for example, this paper came out in 86. I'm going to actually post this paper. You should read it. It's, it's kind of a nice paper, which you, uh, it, it's, it's not, these are not 100 years old, is what I'm saying. It's actually getting to 50 almost, but yeah. Uh, not that old. So, so people are, you know, and then these evolved when these compound semiconductors really started becoming important. Late 80s, early 90s is when indium gallium arsenide really became the uh, layer for uh, a lot of the uh, lasers, right? I mean, for optical communications. Uh, so, indium gallium arsenide is the quantum well layer for um, pretty much uh, all of the optical fiber links today. You know, the laser that feeds the photons into the optical fiber. This is where the light starts, you know, indium gallium arsenide. So it became extremely important to control the material. And so people did a lot of studies. And you know, this is a very nice paper from Ichimura and Sasaki in 86. So I post it. You can read it. And hopefully it will all make sense you know, if I haven't screwed up in my description here. Okay, so, uh, okay but, but the idea, I hope, is clear that you basically the, the entropy is what you need to you know, be, be very careful about. Because as you go into alloy, the entropy term gets a lot more uh, configurations that are possible to it you know, because of the disorder and, and, and all that. Uh, now, uh, so what it's showing is basically, again, uh, that uh, uh, this plot is not for uh, the G, but it's for a ch chosen order parameter, which looks something like this, uh, which depends on, on what we wrote down, you know, the Qs and the, X, uh, the total x. It's a function of. Uh, it's basically a function of Qs here. So, so that's what's plotted here. Yeah. Um, that's not very difficult. If you actually just run it, you should be able to. And then what it's showing is you have, again, uh, uh, the, the, uh, as you increase the temperature, uh, the, you get more homogeneity. But uh, you, know, you may have some fluctuations here at low temperatures. But as you go to higher temperatures, meaning though this is higher in energy, uh, in the order parameter is higher. Uh, you, you, you can actually have some regions that are kinetically stuck here and here too. So, so it's kind of two, two minimum instead of one minimum, uh, and and so on. Okay. Uh, now, uh, if you, I don't want to go go further. If you have quaternaries, you can keep ext extending this idea. You can go to the next step and say so now for quaternaries, instead of energies that look like that, you have energies that will have more terms. Now x, y, right? So a quaternary would be. Uh, a, B, C, D with you know one minus x, x, y, and one minus y, you know, right? And then you can write your whole energy term like that, and the entropy term now will look like that, right? And and then so you plot the whole thing again, right? so and then then see where 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 it's minimized and so on. So if you do that, uh, the quaternaries are obviously extremely important in many three fives, uh, and uh, these are the uh, phase diagrams now for uh, a quaternary uh, where you have indium. Gallium arsenide antimonide. You know, for example, there's the first one is for <clears throat> right. So it is for indium, gallium arsenide, and antimonide. So so uh, and then again, you can have one minus x, y, one minus y, and I think you you know why I'm doing it because you see this is group five. They should add up to one, and group. Oh, sorry, group threes must add up to one. Group fives must also add up to one. Then you get a three five. Right? So, so you have y one minus y and so on. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, so, so that's that's. Uh, for example, what will I have if I have indium, aluminum, arsenide? How how will I write this? How should I choose my x y's and all that here? Here I have only one group five. And all these are group threes, right? 
So how would I write the alloy composition for this, for example? Yeah, exactly. So it will be x, y, 1 minus x minus y. You know, this, we won't touch that for a minute. So, so this should, that's for 3, 5 semiconductors, that's how it should be. Similarly, if you're looking at molysulfide, for example, right, MOS2, then I think you know what to do. And you know, if, you, if you start alloying it with, uh, say, tungsten or some other, this is a layered material now, uh, then you, you should have 1 uh, and 1 minus x here, right? Now, if you f also mix in sulfide and selenides, then you get a y and 2 minus y, something like that, as an example. Right? So, so, so that, and oh, hey, this is nothing very fancy, but essentially you have to keep track of what x and y are, y are and just make sure that this is a very simple rule that it must be stoichiometric in the end, right? So, and, and, yeah. um, but, but then uh, for this alloy, for example, uh, uh, you, you uh, have all the binary constituents, indium arsenide, gallium arsenide, gallium antimonide, indium antimonide. You know, and, then, and then this is, instead of a uh, you know, line, you now have a square, and inside it, uh, these are different uh, wind, uh, circles in some sense, uh, roughly circles or ovals, uh, uh, for spin order decomposition, uh, curves for, you know, f for this curves. Essentially, this is at a, the dark, the solid line is 1,000 degrees C, and it's the same deal as we had. And if you cut across a line here, again, you have two you know, uh, windows where, where, where it's stable. And if you try to create something inside here, it would like to go onto these lines you know, and then stuck there. Right? So, uh, so uh, now these, uh, all, most of these materials are extremely useful uh, for many, many 3.5 uh, devices, uh, for, for uh, uh, high-speed transistors, for RF amplifiers, for lasers, LEDs, all kinds of things. You know? so, uh, so the phosph indium gallium phosphide uh, uh, in gap, uh, where, where is that? So where is the phosphide thing here? So phosphides, yeah, there you go. So uh, whenever you have indium gallium phosphide, this is used for the red LEDs that are, uh, uh, you know, very bright now, high efficiency red LEDs, which are in the tail lights of cars now. So the, you, if you see the new cars, they all have LEDs instead of the old light bulbs with a filter outside. Uh, and that's and then there again, uh, uh, for for bulk production, you generally do not want to grow, uh, well. If the efficiency is high, epitaxy is great. A, a very interesting question is, is uh, can you actually, uh, instead of growing epitaxially like MOCVD or MBE, can you grow a bulk single crystal uh, which would have a certain composition here? You know? and that's really, the th thermodynamics aspects really uh, uh, are telling you whether the bulk phase is possible. I mean, if you try to grow 50% AL gas, 50% in gas, can you grow a bulk crystal, which is 50% out of gas? You know? And generally, that is extremely difficult. You know? so, so when you go to the market and say, I want a single crystal gallium arsenide, fine, you can get it, large wafers of single crystal gallium arsenide. Why? Because people are able to grow the bulk crystal. Bulk crystals are grown typically very close to thermodynamic equilibrium, very close. And there, this is very important, this binaural decomposition, because it will, it's, a th it's close to thermodynamic equilibrium, so it will actually end up there. But uh, if you're growing epitaxially, you can beat a lot of these things. I mean, you can bury non-equilibrium layers for 100 years or something like that. It, it will take 100 years to go back and, 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 and change. So bulk crystal of most alloys are very difficult. But uh, So typically what you're doing is you're starting with a bulk binary alloy of three fives, and then on top of it growing very thin layers wherever you need the devices, you're, going very, uh, you're growing very thin epitaxial layers of, of some of these, you know, in gas or al gas. Or, you're not growing bulk crystals of al gas. And the reason, again, is, is this uh, uh, aspect of, uh, 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 because bulk crystals are grown under thermodynamic equilibrium, it has a very strong tendency to not uh, be uh, a homogeneous alloy, but it's disordered and compositionally fluctuating. There are, because of needs, there are some bulk crystals that are available, but generally not much. I mean, very few, very, very rare. Bulk alloy crystals, that's what I mean. Uh, so even silicon germanium, if you're looking at Seagate, uh, one would think that everything with silicon is bulk crystals, but not really. I mean, uh, if, you are, if you're making devices with silicon germanium, uh, the Seagate alloys uh, typically are used for heterostructure bipolar transistors, HPTs. Uh, you would be growing the CGA layer epitaxially on top of a silicon bulk crystal. So, so you grow it by UHV, uh, CVD, or MBE, or something like that. So, okay, so uh, uh, let me uh, 
I think of myself. So uh, let me see. I'm, I'm not going to go into further details, but I wanted to give you the crux of the matter here. I mean, that's really the main idea here. Uh, and and spinorally composition is a very rich history, and uh, there are all kinds of orderings that can result. Uh, your textbook has a little more description, but I think I. Uh, uh, we did cover the most important. So there are all kinds of other orderings that can develop. There's copper platinum, copper gold ordering. ordering. You know, the, the, uh, as you can see, uh, we just talked about five tetrahedral configurations here, right? We just talked about five tetrahedral configurations, right? But then, if you look at many layers, let's say, you know, uh, this layer, this whole layer here, is one kind, and this whole layer is another kind. You see, I mean, there's, they're ordering on many scales. There's ordering within one tetrahedron. There's ordering between, you know, here, but then there can be long-range ordering as well. So the way they stack, maybe there is one, uh, one B atom, then there are, you know, uh, two B atoms and three B atoms, and then two B atoms, uh, one B atom. So, so they can change long-range as well. So that's that sort of ordering. Uh, and this, uh, for example, in our group too, when we grow, let's say uh, this is an example. We are trying to grow, uh, when we try to grow uh, uh, aluminum, gallium, nitride. Right? So we, we try to grow, say, 80%. We want 80% aluminum, gallium, nitride. Right? So we grow it and we, you know, at a certain temperature and we, we, we then go and look at the cross-section TEM. What you see is the aluminum composition uh, uh, we, we obviously desire it to be 0 0.8 throughout, right? You can count in TEM, you can measure them and count it. Uh, but uh, under certain growth conditions, you will see that the aluminum composition is doing that. Naturally formed composition fluctuation with this long range order. This forms a wave. And so obviously the gallium is doing the opposite, right? And they always add up to a stoichiometric value. Right? So, so uh, and, 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 and then what you can do is uh, try to think along some of these lines or even just experiment and try to increase the temperature and you'll see it will you know kind of go away and finally it will not fluctuate anymore as you raise the temperature for example the, the, these are tricks that you can play when you're doing the growth but if you find it it's also interesting because these things have a natural you know the band gap also changes that way you form a super lattice and all that so that's kind of also interesting so, yeah. <clears throat> And uh, uh, so these would be called, typically called spontaneously formed super lattices, as an, as an example. Okay. So uh, the one thing I didn't mention in detail uh, is, is uh, the, another thing that plays a very big role in this energetics, which we have neglected. But you, uh, you know, this is basically just the bond energies, but you can add energies because of strain. Strain plays a big role, so you should add that. You, know, so you have a strain layers, and typically many of these are strain layers. but. Uh, 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 yeah, so strain can also drive many of these orderings or, or compositional fluctuations and so, so on. So the strain energy is another important parameter that I've not, we have not discussed at all. Okay, so um, what I want to do next, uh, uh, well, uh, let me see, are there any quick questions? I, have, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about kinetics because this is all thermodynamically possible, but, the way, but whether it will happen or not is another question. Right? So, yeah. so any questions here? Well, if not, let's uh, move over to the uh, aspects of kinetics here. Uh, and and uh, uh, um, I'm, all right, I'll, I'll basically come back to the other story here later. So for example, you can actually have uh, materials. Uh, th this is an example, gallium uh, antimonide, which is 3,5, mixed with germanium. These things have pretty much no miscibility, I mean, meaning you can't really uh, from the phase diagram and all, they are completely immiscible. But when you actually deposit it on a layer, uh, on, 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 on some substrate, you see that they actually can mix and you can create a structure of that. And that's, that's basically uh, germanium, uh, uh, well, this, this particular example, uh, it's an example of something that is kinetically, uh, um, thermodynamically forbidden, but kinetically allowed, you know, because it, it takes. It has a very long decomposition time and rates. Okay, so, and then there are quite few, quite a few others. Okay. So, uh, um, so what we'll do is is develop the very basic notion of what are the driving forces behind, uh, or, or what are the uh, sk sk you know how do you think about the kinetic problem? So, so, <clears throat> so uh, what we'll do is uh, I think kinetics. We can start with a very simple picture. This you have seen uh, obviously uh, probably many many times. Uh, if you have a reaction. Right? 
where your species A and species maybe BC2, or, you know, something like that, molysulfide maybe, you know, and, and tungsten or something like that. And you want to have a chemical reaction to go here, right, let's say. Uh, then, uh, there's, then there's a rate of reaction. I think this, this you have probably seen in many courses, introductory courses as well. Uh, and, and the reaction rate is, is uh, uh, for, I don't want to write it here, but the reaction rate is, is the composition of A, uh, uh, but since there are two of them, you get a square, right? And composition of B divided by, this is the forward rate of reaction, reaction going in the forward direction. Uh, and, and divided by the end results, you know, A2, uh, compositions, A2 and B2. Um, so, uh, and, and, and the coefficient here is the, uh, uh, it's a rate. So the coefficients have units of one over seconds. It's a rate, right? Uh, uh, and uh, so the K0 would be what you'd call an attempt frequency. And this, uh, the rate is always, uh, uh, there's a certain energy cost for this to happen. And this is what's shown here. If you have two atoms of B, and a BC2 at, uh, molecule here, and then you want to go into this situation where you have A to B plus C2, right? There's a potential barrier to that, right? And that's why the reaction didn't occur till you put them together in one beaker, and then you know you started the reaction, right? So and then there's a potential barrier to that, and the rate uh, uh, or the coefficient, the rate coefficient, is a term frequency times uh, thermodynamic, uh, you know, uh, probability of this thing happening. Right. It's kind of a Boltzmann uh, or Maxwell Boltzmann sort of a, a picture where you have e to the minus delta H by kT. Right. This is a very, I think hopefully it's a standard notion for any reaction, you would have something like that. Right? Uh, and uh, the, then you can, uh, so the reaction may be that uh, there's a, you know, the barrier and then the pro end, pro end products, the total energy of this is lower than this, so there'll be a, a certain amount of energy that would be released after this reaction could be due to light emission could be due to you know heat emission whatever right so 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 there is an uh, this so some amount of energy that will be released into the surroundings uh, uh, and and then you can take take it and make it more complicated you say well i i know that this is not the only reaction there are many steps happening in between right and then you write the rate re equation for each one you have a forward reaction you have a reverse reaction and then you get a reaction for the total thing right and then you'll have all these feedback loops in between, right? And the net reaction rate would look like that, forward and backward. And you can you know, uh, work this part out. I'm not trying to describe this in detail. But what I want to do is start looking at uh, when you want to grow an alloy, how does this play, play a role? When you want to grow an alloy, right? I mean, you, uh, when you want to grow an alloy, it's really you are indeed mixing you know, uh, uh, multiple species like, like such, right? Uh, and, and, and then you want something to happen here. For example, I'm kind of mixing indium, arsenic, and gallium, and I want it to have indium gallium arsenide here, for example. Right? So, so this is really uh, uh, also a rate, rate equation. That's, and uh, 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 the kinetics is, is basically given by the time scale of this equation. Right? So, so what is the rate? You know, if you get a e to the power minus t by tau, that tau is what we are after. Right? So how, how long will it take for this reaction to go to completion? Right, so uh, when we deposit something on a crystal, uh, this is again a very simple notion. I think you may have seen it multiple times. When you deposit uh, uh, you know, a certain amount of material uh, on a, you know, uh, 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 say, indium gallium arsenide on a substrate, so we're trying to do epitaxy. And, and uh, uh, I, I'll just kind of sketch this in this way. I think you, you probably have seen. So, so let's say uh, you have a blob of this material uh, where you have indium and gallium and arsenic or something like that mixed up, and then uh, uh, there are what we are going to see is there are multiple energy there are a couple of en energy scales here that we need to uh, worry about, right? So there'll be an energy scale for this material, and this is your substrate, right? There's an energy scale for this material to be itself and not conform to the substrate. The substrate could be something different. So say you deposit indium gallium arsenide on gallium arsenide, let's say. The lattice, there's lattice mismatch, there's all these other things, so there's strain. So there'll be an energy scale for this material to be itself. And that energy scale, we're going to call it delta H. You know, this is what is being, this is enthalpy of formation, something like that, okay? So energy scale for the material to be itself, and this is per unit volume. What does it mean? It means that if I have a sphere of radius R, 
then the total energy for indium gallium arsenide to just form a blob and not be conformal on the substrate would be, you know, uh, 4 by 3 pi r cubed, which is the volume times delta H, is the amount of energy that you have to spend. Uh, the energy that that uh, uh, is is necessary to form a form a big blob of this. That's that's the, right. So the other energy scale is associated with the interface energy here. Interface energy, yeah. right? The interface energy is uh, let's label it as gamma s, right? And then that's what uh, again from your book, and and uh, uh, so. Uh, now this energy, let's write it as gamma s, and uh, I, I think you probably if, you, if, you, if I had a half circle, these are all very rough scales, you have some geometric factors, and if I had a half circle, then this is the energy of this, or the surface interface energy per unit area, because interface is an area, right? it's not a volume, uh, so it's the interface energy per unit area, so therefore the energy uh, cost of forming a larger area or, or an area of uh, uh, radius, you know, of a circle, circular area of this much. And radius is, is this much. Right? Does that make sense? And these are the two energy scales that are going to go against each other, right? Compete against each other. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. What I just wrote. So there are two energy scales. Very simple picture. Nothing very complicated right now. So there is an energy scale that's saying, well, I don't want it to form a blob. I want it to form a uniform layer. Right? And there's another energy scale that's saying, no, I want to form a blob. Right? And they're going to go against each other, right? And so the co there's a competition between the gamma s and the delta h. Com competition, and that will determine whether you form a, a quantum dot or you form a thin film quantum well or something like that. That's what's going to determine it. Now, yeah. now uh, uh, the, the the thing is, so, so the volume energy, uh, uh, as you you know uh, increase the volume, I think you know that because of crystallization, the volume energy is all the, the delta h is going to be negative, and or rather negative, this is going to be positive. Surface energy negative. Maybe you can justify yourself, but, but essentially as you form, the whole reason why, say, uh, you know, indium, gallium, and arsenic don't want to be, you know, live around separately, but want to form a crystal is because it can lower its total energy. I mean, that's the reason why we started forming an alloy in the first place, right? So, so delta H is negative, that thing is positive, so if you sketch it, now, as a function of the radius of this little cluster, let's say, uh, uh, what it's saying is, well, you have one term that's going like that, the surface energy. The other term is going something like that, which is the volume energy. And the total energy, therefore, uh, uh, if you do the numbers, it's going to kind of first increase, and then it's going to, sorry, it's going to kind of do like that. Uh, and and uh, so that's what's shown here, and and and, and this is now uh, the energy barrier. Uh, let, let's label it as E star, or uh, called the nucleation energy. So so what are we doing? We're nucleating a layer where basically we want it to go uniformly. If we want it to go in uniformly, you have to provide this much energy, and then you tip it over, and the radius. Okay, so it'll fixed. There will be a certain critical radius, and then if you are able to provide this much energy, then you let the system go. It will basically form a layer. Uh, sorry, what, it will form volume, right? The volume wins. If you are below that, it forms a layer. So, am I saying this right? No, just a second. So this energy is for interface to dominate. Uh, uh, you want, we want to lower your energy. You want to have the lowest energy, right? Interface and volume. So. Uh, uh, typically, uh, let me so, so intuitively you can imagine if you have a lower uh, temperature, give it a lower energy, it would try to form blobs. If you want to give it a high energy, it's going to spread out and form uh, interface layer. But these are very intuitive concepts that may go wrong if if these energies uh, scales are not 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 what you expect. You know, so. But uh, I think that's that's reasonably correct. That if you want to form a thin film, uh, uh, you generally want to increase the temperature and make it flow laterally. And this energy barrier is what, I mean, this is exactly what uh, uh, we, we just discussed here. I mean, we're just mapping it to this problem. This is the same energy barrier. We're kind of trying to find out what is the scale of this energy barrier for a chemical reaction to happen. We go over from here, uh, from a, you know, something like that to a, something which is flat and planar and a quantum well sort of structure. Uh, and then there's a critical radius. Uh, and then uh, the rate of that reaction is now looking like this. 
because the rate is proportional to the barrier height of, of that, that reaction. And you immediately get some orders of magnitude of this energy scale you know, by, by just saying that you know, where is the maxima of that, right? I, I think that's a pretty trivial problem. This is the total energy, so you find a maxima of this, you get a critical radius, and you get the critical energy from there, and the energy looks something like this. It's its cube of the surface energy divided by square of the volume energy. Uh, and then uh, uh, the um, so uh, just to uh, again maybe I was a little confusing earlier, but uh, essentially what it's saying is surface energy is increasing at, like Q, as the square of this uh, radius of this cluster, while volume energy is decreasing as Q, right? And so as you keep adding more atoms into this, you know, basically, uh, uh, this is not a static situation. You have stuff coming in, you know, you're growing, doing growth, right? You have stuff coming in continuously. So your radius is supposed to grow, and then at a certain point, uh, you know, it, it, the, 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 the energy of the cluster increases with the addition of atoms up to a certain critical size, uh, beyond which the energy decreases with atom addition. So, so uh, you know, essentially, uh, at a certain point, it would rather you know break apart uh, rather n not form a cluster anymore but go and form a planar planar cell structure so, so that's really what it means here yeah. okay so the last point though is how fast uh, uh, are these things happening and already you have a certain rate uh, evident here uh, r0 uh, and and this rate of this reaction has frequencies in it uh, as as we saw i mean the rate would be you know some r not e to the power minus this activation energy, which is this term here, right, uh, divided by kT, uh, Boltzmann t, and the rate is what we are after. Now, what is that rate at which uh, stuff can happen here? Meaning, uh, can and then that rate clearly is determined by two things. I mean, one is the f inflow of matter, or you know, inflow of the material that's coming in, and the other is how fast can atoms diffuse on the surface? How fast can atoms diffuse, right, on on the surface? That's 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 obviously a very important parameter. Here and what we want to do is uh, maybe in the last uh, few minutes we have in the class uh, talk about this diffusion problem because this, uh, uh, this is uh, probably one of the most important things in, in, in any kinetic problem is how fast can atoms diffuse from one side to another or, or no, over the wafer and, and then things like that. So uh, and the diffusion problem uh, uh, I think you probably have seen it many many times and it's a very generic problem as well just like the spin orderly decomposition uh, was related to entropy and it was a generic problem. Diffusion is obviously also a very, very generic problem. And uh, why, why are the atoms diffusing? Well, so you have indium gallium arsenide, let's say here, and you know, if you look at the surface and look at the microscopic picture, the microscopic picture of the surface is, well, you have atoms in there too, right? And, and uh, uh, let's say you have you know, some indium, and arsenic, depending upon which phase you are, you may have all indium or you have some indium arsenic, indium arsenic, and all that depends, right? So, and then you have stuff that has landed on it, and I think you know that the, uh, again, uh, looking at it as individual atoms, uh, there is a, uh, you know, this sort of a poten chemical, poten uh, rather, energy scale that uh, atoms uh, have uh, when they come close to other atoms. And so, uh, if you look at the energy landscape, you know, almost classical uh, for an atom to go across here, it will again look, you know, the, let's say you have an arsenic atom that has landed here and you have, this is indium, this is arsenic. Uh, arsenic would not like to bond with arsenic, but arsenic would like to bond, bond with indium. So, so there'll be an energy landscape that will look, you know, uh, very low here and then maybe a little high here and, you know, it, it, will, it will look something like that. Some, some, some sort of a feature like that. Uh, and then the arsenic atom has to, oh, sorry, has to diffuse on the surface, and then it will end up maybe landing here and uh, maybe bond with it, or if it has enough energy, it may overshoot and go over to the next one, and so on. This is the, you know, it's, it's a random walk. It's going to be a random walk. And this whole random walk physics is captured by uh, how far is this atom going to diffuse, right? Is, let's say, L how far it's going to diffuse before it gets incorporated or get, gets captured in a such well like that, right? And uh, so I think you know for a diffusive process, how do I find L? This is probably something you've seen many times. How far can something diffuse in a given a time t? 
Right, exactly right. So this is really, th that's what it is. So essentially it's going to be square root of d times t. How far it's going to, you give it time t, t microseconds, t milliseconds, t seconds, whatever. How far can it diffuse is, is given by this, right? And this is t is the time, and this is a diffusion constant. And I think you, you see there is a rich load, you know, a lot of physics that, uh, that has been buried inside this sort of a ensemble behavior, but this is how it's going to look. The diffusion constant, D, is very strongly temperature dependent, and there's an energy associated with that, E diffusion over KT, right? And this E diffusion is, in some sense, this height, but not exactly, you know, this is something like that. Right? So, so this height, uh, which is diffusing, right? And, uh, uh, and this result, uh, uh, I think, is uh, obviously of great importance. Uh, uh, because that tells you many things. If you put a dopant in a material, and then, uh, so instead of trying to grow gallium arsenide, let's say you have silicon, and you want to dope it with phosphorus, so you put some phosphorus atoms on the surface, and if you leave it like that, it's going to sit on the surface forever. It's not going to go anywhere, right? Because it can diffuse, but it doesn't have enough diffusion constant at room temperature. T is low, this is low, doesn't diffuse. So you take it and you heat it up, right? And it, you know this is the diffusion doping of semiconductors. You basically drive it in because you increase this, and then by controlling the time very accurately, you can control the doping profile now, right? So, so how, how far it goes in and, and that sort of thing. And the square root of dt, I think, is a very standard thing, but I think you, you, you probably know uh, 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 that uh, yeah, any diffusion process uh, uh, will will lead to uh, you know, it's, it's a random walk process, it's a very general process, right? So if you start from, if your atom lands at site A, and let's say we are looking at a three-dimensional solid, and the atom can not only diffuse on the surface, it can also go in and diffuse and replace atoms inside the material as well. It's possible, right? So it can dig into the material. It's unlike, uh, less likely, but very possible. So uh, essentially, uh, let's say you give it a certain time t, and uh, it, it diffuses between lattice sites, you know, does some sort of a random walk, right? Right. Something like that. The atom lands at the site and then diffuses based on the temperature, uh, and and you can track it by saying th these are the uh, you know uh, lattice vectors for each hop, right? R four and on and so on. Let's say R n, right? So it has n steps. It, it diffuses for n steps, right? And uh, what is the claim? Is that if I give it time t, then this quantity here. Is square root of dt. That's what we have said. That's the physical meaning of it, right? That's how far it's going to diffuse, right? And I think you probably have seen how you get this. This is basically the total vector from the initial to the final is r1 plus r2 plus r3 plus rn, right? right? That's the total vector, big R, right? And the length, uh, basically, the length would be mod r squared square root. That's the length how far it's diffusing, right? And then I think you see now that you get uh, R1 square, R2 square, plus all that. Do you see that in this dot product with itself? Okay. Plus R1 dot R2 plus R2, R1 dot R3, and all these cross terms. Right? And I think we are using the same trick here as we did for the structure factor. All the cross terms, it's a random walk. So the sum is zero, right? because they're going in all directions, right? So the sum is zero, and you end up with, you know, only the square, square terms survive here. Th does that make sense? And we are going to basically L square is just that, right? And so you get basically, if you have n steps, then you get, you know, more average value of R. Does that make sense? And then n steps, every step, let's say it takes delta t time, and so uh, essentially what it's saying is, is uh, uh, the, the thing is scaling with number of steps now. Not number of atoms, but the number of steps. And, and when you take a square root, you get a square root of that, and times the diffusion length of each step. And that's really, uh, each step is basically a velocity times time is the length, or, or you know, that's the it's proportional to time, and it's proportional to time. And so that's where your square root of dt is coming from. And, and the mod square of this, the d, uh, d naught, is related the d naught here d naught e to the minus e diffusion by kt times uh, time this is temperature right 
Uh, this D naught is related to the vibration frequency of the crystal, the phonon frequency, the lattice vibration frequency. This is very much related to that. Uh, it's a diffusion constant. Uh, it's not a time. Uh, so diffusion constant would be some velocity squared times a time constant, right? I mean, in units, I think you know this probably. So yeah, and and uh, 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 the uh, anyway, I don't want to get into so so the time scales here are very fast. The attempt frequency every time. So uh, it's basically the atom is trying to uh, making a lot of attempts to go across this barrier, uh, and and the attempt frequency is of the order of uh, the phonon. You know the, the vibration frequencies of the crystal. Phonon frequencies typically of the order of 10 to about 12 hertz. Every second is trying 10 to about 12 times to go out, and go across and so of the order. Okay, so uh, I think uh, uh, hopefully uh, okay. So this random walk problem is exactly the same, and then I, I think you hopefully see also the reason you get the square root of dt. It's the same thing as you get a diffuse scattering when you're doing X-ray and you know read or something like that. I remember the term that was, uh, 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 so there are two terms, right? One is completely diffuse scattering, which has no features left anymore. The other is gives you all the peaks because of crystalline order, right? Here, those peak terms, crystalline order term is zero because it's a random walk, and you get just the diffuse part. And that's why it's called diffusion. I mean, this is the diffusive. Well, it's kind of talking in circles now, but yeah, yeah. Uh, the name comes from here. Uh, that it's a random walk and diffusion. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll basically uh, stop this part here, and then what I'll say is uh, there are a couple of small things that I've not covered, but essentially uh, I have discussed uh, most of the things in in uh, in, in the two chapters. Uh, so I would really uh, urge you to start reading it in detail. This is chapter four and six okay, from your book, and uh, the next assignment we'll have a few problems on 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 on, on these topics of uh, you know alloys and decomposition and and, and things like that. Okay, good. Thanks. <coughs>